Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Today, the 27th of January, we're going to have Gary Begley from Lebanon, Ohio. And the weekly tip, it's going to be talking about a great CDC substitute and how to use it. We're the BT's from Boise, Idaho. Joining us is Gary, uh, Gary Begley, and Gary Begley from Lebanon, Ohio, has fished since he was four years old, fly fishing exclusively for the last 30 years. He became interested in fly tying before learning to fly fish. He organized and helped teach the casting classes for his local club, the Buckeye United Fly Fishers, for several years, becoming an FFI certified casting instructor and a member of the FFI fly tying group during that time. He has received the Buckeye United Fly Fishers Fly Fisher of the Year Award and the Fly Tying Award. He has helped teach beginning, intermediate, and advanced tying classes for several years. Gary has ran a monthly tie and lie for the past 14 years, 12 in person and two via Zoom. Let's welcome Gary to BT Fly Tying Friday. Gary, it's all yours. All right. Well, thank you, Al and Gretchen, for allowing me to uh, present tonight on this virtual venue, I'll call it. Um, <clears throat> Al mentioned the um, my local club, Buckeye United Fly Fishers. It's a Cincinnati-based club, and we are an FFI affiliate, or one of the one of the clubs that make up the Ohio Council of the FFI. And um, Cincinnati area. I'm I'm about 35 miles north of Cincinnati, out out in the country, so to speak, away from a small town. And um, being, if you're not familiar with Cincinnati, it's we're in the very southwestern corner of the state, uh, deeply embedded in warm water fly fishing territory. Uh, we don't have local trout streams at all. I have to travel to get to them. Um, I do have two trout patterns planned because I do. Do enjoy uh, trout fishing. I should probably go ahead and put the uh, screen share up. Give you guys a minute or two to have a look at the recipes. Well, I should say uh, the material list. First fly is going to be a uh, standard dry fly called a GDF. One that I came up with for fishing a uh, specific place that I want to mention, uh, going to describe to you. And the other one is a fly that a guide has used. Um, frankly, all over the United States, for that matter. So at this point in my life, where I where I like to go uh, fishing would be about into Tennessee. It's about six and a half hours south for me, into the Appalachian Mountains, um, into the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. There's um, there they they claim there's about 800 miles of streams inside the park, and as to my knowledge, they all carry trout. I know I could vouch for several of them because I've, I've pulled some out. Um, what I'd like to do at this point in my life, while I'm still young enough, and yes, I said young enough with all this gray hair, uh, you go to the higher elevations, uh, meaning 3,000 feet and higher. They have restored uh, a few of the streams back to their natural state, back mm -hmm. to the natural strain, of the original strain of book trout that was there, I should probably say, centuries ago. Um, there's, there's, it's a lot of work to get up there. But it's worth it. The um, the brook that that strain of brook trout is they're about six eight. Usually, what I catch is eight six. I'm sorry, eight to ten inch long. I've caught a few over ten inches, but and it, it's a lot of work and a lot of equipment to get up there. And but it's worth it. Uh, they're beautiful little fish, absolutely beautiful little fish. You could uh, I don't have a picture of one to show you, but you could Google Eastern Tennessee uh, brook trout. And, and see what they look like. And um, it's it's a lot of fun to catch them. You got to be stealth. There's a there's a bit of an art an art to it. And um, it's twist it's switching around to start to um, introduce my fly. The next fly that's coming up. Found myself a nice rock to sit on, and I really started paying attention to the water, how fast it's running. It's really in a hurry to get down off the mound. Very turbulent. And the fish, like I said, they strike like lightning. I wonder, I really wonder if actually I developed a theory for myself that do they have enough time to 
figure out what uh, what color that fly is before they strike. I question that. Um, I wonder if they could if they even care if there's a wing on the fly, let alone having one that's split as opposed to a single wing. So <clears throat> what I did was I decided that by the next time I went down, I would uh, develop a fly, just a plain generic dry fly and land colors, not trying to match any sort of hatch or anything, just right proportions and uh, and see how I do with just that fly. That put that put the worries about am I fishing the right fly? Is it the right color? All that I put all that aside, and my catch rate went way up. I was really pleased with the way uh, the way it performed. I think what happened is I tricked myself into paying more attention to the to reading the water and to the proper presentation. I believe is what is what happened. But uh, the little fly, like I said, I call it a, a GDF, a generic dry fly. It's uh, I'll show you the fly. I think I have him in device over here. Yeah, just a plain old dry fly, nothing special. Um, but I thought it would be a good pattern to tie tonight because it'll allow me to share some te techniques that I've learned over the years. I've taken many, many classes. I'm well over thirty classes with some some mm -hmm. very prominent fly tires. Um, a different set of the ones that are online or, or the frequent uh, BTs tying. What I've done is just taken the materials that I like to use for the various components of a dry fly and put them on this hook. For example, um, I like uh, Coq de Leon for the tail. I like super fine dubby. Well, back to the materials. I've got them out over here. Let me just show you. I'll go over them real quick before I, before I start tying. Hook is just a standard dry fly hook. This, I'm going to use 14. 14. Size 14 seems to be good for, uh, for our demonstrations for me. I've tied them from size 10 down to 24. Usually what I fish down there is is 16, 18. That's what I generally take. Uh, this particular brand is a, is a wide gape hook, which I really like. It's 1X fine wire. Uh, for the tail, like I mentioned, Coq de Leon. This is a whiting from a whiting um, tailing pack. And the next thing I'm going to tie on when I in the order of tying will be the wing. I put the wing on just for me. Uh, this bright orange color, fluorescent orange, so I can see the darn thing as it's as it's flying down downstream, in and out of the various uh, light conditions. That that it is. It's this very wooded area, as you might as you might guess. And I mentioned uh, super fine dubbing for the body. I really like using that stuff. I'll explain a little bit more about it. Uh, later, probably all of you are familiar with it. And hackle is um, just grizzly hackle. A uh, it's pretty simple, just four four materials and a hook. And uh, there's no questions at this point. I'll go ahead and go back to the device and drop that out and see if I can duplicate it for you. Okay, drop this out. Put a fresh hook in. And thread, I'm going to use, just going to use black thread, black eight aughts, what I'm going to use, uni thread. I'm going to start my thread in the center of the hook shank in order to accurately find the third of a hook shank. That's going to need an explanation. I understand. Two, three. We'll come back. So now I'm in the center of the hook shank, and I'm going to go one, two, three, four turns forward. That should put me exactly at the one-third point. That needs an explanation. I, I spent uh, spent spent a few years now, but I spent a lot of time teaching uh, beginning tying class for the uh, for my local club, and I uh, wasn't very experienced at it yet. I hadn't hadn't learned the rope, so to speak. And there was a class that uh, I decided to do dry flies. I was going to do two dry flies, and I uh, just asked everybody to start their thread a third of the way back from the hook eye. And we'll tie the fly. And they, they could see what I was doing. We had a big monitor up on the wall. And I just went ahead and tied and sat there and let them tie and let them tie. And we get at the end of the, that fly, I walked around to see how everybody had done. Well, I quickly noticed there was about seven or eight different opinions in the room as to where one third of the hook shank is. So, and, and I got another dry fly coming up right now. Uh, so I had to, I had to try to think fast which I'm not always able to do. And uh, I got to figure out a better way to convey how to get to the third of the hook shank uh, for him. So I set down my vice 
started the thread halfway and I thought, all right, good night. I'm going to take a, a take account how many turns it's going to take to get to where I, what looks like to be a third of a hook shank for me. So I did that and asked him, I told him, I forget, I forget if it was three, four or five turns in front of the halfway point. And I asked him to start to thread at the halfway point and, and I, Looked around real quick and walked around actually while they were doing that. They were all hitting the center of the hook shank darn near perfectly. And so, okay, this, this is going to be great. So I had them, uh, had them do that. And that pretty much got rid of the terribly misproportioned flies that we had at the, at the uh, for the first fly. So that, that explains that. Now, oh, yeah, uh, one other thing I'll show you before I came back to the next season to, to uh, casting our tying class, I got a little carried away and I actually measured with a digital caliper how where exactly where a third of the hook is. So I could tell them exactly how many turns of thread to take. And if you noticed, I put this, I started at the center and wrapped it back and came back. So let's see how well I did. This is set at a third of the hook shank for this. So that looks pretty darn close to me. So it works. All right. So I'm looking for a third of the hook shank. It's so I, it's kind of a landmark for me. So nothing goes in front of that until it's fine for, uh, for hackling. Perhaps the wing might go, or uh, standing the wing up might go over to there. Now, I'm going to stop shy of the hook point in order to tie on the wing. I said wing. I meant tail. Um, Tails usually like a hook shank length are a little bit longer. I, I like mine a little bit longer. So actual tie-in point's going to be back here where my fingers are. But I'm going to start it here. Now, let me see. I, I like to measure, use the scissors to measure. And that's a little bit long. Let's it out some. Taking soft turns here to get back to the end of the straight part of the hook, which is actually this hook and most other ones are, is where the uh, barb is. Cut this off. I don't need the rest of that. And we're up here. Time to tie on the wing. Get my Hair post material. It's going to need to end up about hook shank length and a little bit longer. I'm going to spin my thread counterclockwise so it will jump back when I lift it up. Let's see where I'm at back here. It's not too bad. Now, before I stand the wing up, I'm going to cut off this excess so the wing won't get in the way. Where that one came from. I am going to go ahead and bind this down. I'm going to post this, and if I leave material sticking up back there, it's going to do nothing but get in the way. Or two. All right. Stand the wing up. This I've heard referred to as building a thread dam. Now I'm going to post it. On tight on the material and tight thread wrap. Now I relax pressure on both of them. That's what I didn't want to happen. There we go. Just getting ready to say this could be a difficult task for beginning level. And sometimes for people who spend time a while. Okay. There we go. What I like about having to post for this, I can push it forward, get it out of my way. Push it backward so I can work in front of it. 
So now it's time to do some dubbing. We need a body. Again, I want to stop shy of the <clears throat> hook point to start doing my dubbing. This is um, super fine dubbing, as I mentioned. It's uh, permanently waterproofed material. It works great for dry flies. The you can see it's really long strands. They're uh, <clears throat> excuse me. A um, the staple length, which is the length of each individual fiber, is one and a quarter to one and a half inches long. And you need to get them going all the same direction. In the package, they come up. They get uh, pointing every, every which direction. What I'm doing here is stacking. Pull this out, stack it on top. Pull this out, stack it on top. You get, get some going in, a, in a relatively close to the same direction. And uh, don't need much at all. Just a whisper, basically. I don't know if you can see that on my finger or not. Probably shows up a little bit better on the thread. But now I started way back here on the, uh, I want my body to start here. Let me scoot in a little bit. I want the body to start back here at that tie-in point for the tail. But I stopped here and I've got some bare thread. Now what a lot of tires do is just scoot that dubbing noodle up. I don't like to do that because the way I approach dubbing is I'm twisting it on and I'm getting a good tight connection to the thread. And if I just scoot it up, didn't I just lose that connection? I think so. Now, okay, for those of you that are thinking, well, I've scooted my dubbing up for years and the flies look fine and the fish just fine. I'll be the first one to be in line to agree with you. because I did the same thing for many, many years. But I just kind of look at this as a, as a method to fine tune. So now when I get back here, I'm right there at the uh, spot that I want my dubbing to start. And something else I want to show you at this point. I don't do this when I've tied this fly. But it's, this is a perfect opportunity to show you. There's a, there's a method where you can make it look like there are body segments in the dubbing. I'm going to go about a 45 degree angle, then I'll come back and fill up that space I left. About a 45 degree angle, all right, over, angle over, and then fill that space up. Come over, all the way up through. Now, here's something else that I do dubbing-wise. I'm kind of a dubbing Nazi, so to speak. Um, I like to get things good. I, I like to get things right. Before I run out of dubbing, I'm going to add some more, because I, I need some more, obviously. But before I run out, I like to add some. That way I'm not wrapping bare thread through my dub body. Over, back, over, like that, like that uh, bulge there. Over and back. Just going to need a little bit more. And leave some bare space in between there to uh, tie the hackle on, which is the next step. Now, I've got hackle already prepared. Dull side, shiny side. I like shiny side facing forward. Now, the way I was taught years ago to tie hackle on is to take scissors and Cut off the barbs down to where they're just real small, kind of like a real sh uh, short teeth on a comb. And you can bind, use that to bind through and it won't pull out. Well, I've since learned that there's much better ways, ways that I like better anyway. And a lot, most of the other methods where you tie it on, you tie it on parallel with the hook shank. And then what's the first thing we do? We pull it up 90 degrees. So I say, why don't we just tie it on 90 degrees to begin with? And I like to tie in bare stem. I've got more bare stem over here than I do on this side. This is this lead side where I'm going to start tying. I'll start wrapping, rather. 
I'm going to take a wrap over top of this, pull it taut, come back around in between the hook and that bare shank, bare stem, and bind this down as we go. All right. Seen very few people do that. Al is one of them. I don't have to put a uh, half hitch in here, but I'm going to because I'm going to use my rotary function of the vise. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show you how I do the uh, whip finish. I like to get my vodkin involved. I just put it right here on, the, on this finger and do a normal half hitch movement. Now, I've got, of course, I've got a little loop there, but it's closed. Uh, instead of having a big loop that might catch all kind of um, material, I've got it well contained. That was yeah. worth the entry fee right there, Gary. Oh, the, <laughs> The half hitch. Do, that, right. again. Do that again. Do yes. That. Please. Oh, no, I already took a picture of the mounting, so I gotta actually I've been able to slide it underneath some errant hackle too. That's just too darn easy. That's too <laughs> Oh man! You know how much easier that's going to make tying flies for my students. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Great. A bodkin, bodkin whip finish. Now, throw some terminology at you. I just put my bobbin holder in my bobbin holder cradle. Yeah, I know, but I really think that we should be referring to the spool of thread as a bobbin. This is the bobbin holder. And what I just put my bobbin holder in is a bobbin holder cradle. Awful wordy, I know, but. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna wrap this hackle. And like I said, with this post, I can push it forward while I'm wrapping behind. I'll take one more right there. Now I can push this back and it won't be in the way when I'm Wrapping in front of. Oh, I like that a lot. It's all nice and smooth and easy. Um, now, I'm going to get my thread back up here. And this last turn of hackle, I'm going to take in front of the thread. That crosses over. And actually, that binds it down. And if I can get my wing out of the way. I'm going to go back behind it. That's the next trip trick that's worth worth the entry fee. <laughs> now this this little procedure right here, I have seen both Al and Gretchen do, and I'm grateful that they shared it online because it helped get my thread head size down quite a bit. I've got some couple. I got some hackle that's not cooperating with me. I can't seem to get to go back now. Get this all pulled back. One did one did sneak in front. So back to the half hitch. I like to make the half hitch back at the back of the head. So it won't go anywhere because I, I use the bog, I use the same basically the same same method to do uh, the whip finish. Now, I've got this little guy right here. I don't appreciate. Maybe I can go ahead and cut him out. I'll go ahead and get rid of this thread first. Now, if I go in there chopping with my scissors, I'm going to cut off half those barbs. So I just open the, the scissors, work it like, almost like a knife blade, and just pop the thread off by pulling it, pull it taut. And somewhat the same with the hackle. I'm going to pull the hackle tight, come in with my scissors open just barely, push that, that just cuts off the hackle as opposed to all the barbs that I don't want to cut off. The next one is a fly. 
don't have quite as many techniques to show you. I do have a couple, but um, I'm basically showing this fly to you guys because it absolutely works. I have caught those little brook trout I've mentioned before. I've caught rainbow. I have caught brown. I have caught a few smallmouth bass in my area. Um, it's not much of a offering for a smallmouth. Of course, you could tie it in a lot bigger sizes. Um, size 8 down to 18 is what's recommended. And um, and the uh, the fly was a, a guide came up with it. It's I found the pattern about 10 years ago, and he had been working on it and tweaking it and such for the nine years prior to that. So it's a pretty old pattern. And um, again, I just absolutely love it. I I especially if I go down to the uh, Smoky Mountains, I definitely have these in my box, no question. When when the dry flies don't work, I can put this little guy in, and and even in a pool, I can strip it, and uh, and they seem to love it. I would imagine it's for, probably for two reasons. Got the rubber legs, you got some motion, and the uh, there's some lead underneath that bead, and it's going to make it a lot heavier. It's going to get the get it down in that turbulent water better as well. And it's called the only. And apparently the guy, the, the guide's father named it because he said there's a good probability that's the only fly that his, his son was going to use when he was out. He was uh, guiding people. He actually guided in the Appalachian Mountains and in the Rockies and did quite well with it both places. So I've got the materials out here. You guys kept me talking long. I kept talking long enough that... Uh, Got the materials out so a little bit a little bit more material wise um need the hook just a this is just a plain old 2x long nymph hook the uh bead is a gold bead and lead wire the lead wire is optional of course lead lead or lead free your choice um i tie some without extra weight just to bead i tie some with like fifteen thousandths diameter and i tie some with like twenty five thousandths diameter and i have devised a way i'll show you later i have devised a way where i can tell tell them apart in my box i'm just looking in the box and say oh there's the heavier one there's the medium one and there's the one with just a bead so the tail is going to be this uh, soft hackle pin it's a uh, speckled brown and we need a rib, so it's French tinsel, oval gold French tinsel. This size is small for this size hook. And uh, I've often thought that that's that maybe wire would be better and be more um, durable. But I tried some wire, a couple of different sizes of wire, and it seems to just bury itself in in the dubbing. So I stick with the French tinsel, and I don't have any problems with it, frankly. Um, the dubbing, it could, the pattern calls for Dave Whitlock SLF. SLF is synthetic living fibers. And uh, it's the color that he that Dave used on his red fox squirrel nip, which is a fantastic nip, by the way, if you're not familiar with it. And, um, of course, if you don't know, we, just lost, we lost Dave not too long ago. It was very unfortunate because he was a very good tire. He, he brought a lot to fly fishing, um, fly fishing and fly tying. And I actually, I got to meet and speak with Dave on two different occasions, which I will always remember because he was quite a, quite a guy. Um, legs, silly legs are under here. They're uh, a little more flexible in the water than the medium-sized round rubber legs that most of us use. Um, it's a little, a little more fragile on the vice, I, although I haven't had any problems with them breaking in the water. I've seen that these are silly legs. I have seen this. It, it seems to be the same material to me, uh, marketed as loco legs, crazy legs. I don't know how many other synonyms you can come up with, but or the, they're going to come up with to, as far as a sales gimmick. But the uh, actually, that is that's all the materials because um, except for the wing case. There, that's what I was forgetting. The wing case is going to be uh, peacock curl. I'm going to use probably four, four uh, peacock curl up from under the eye. And that's another thing that I kind of thought, well, that's going to be awful fragile material, but 
and I thought, well, maybe I could put some UV uh, resin on top of it. And then I'm thinking, well, that's going to take away from some of the coloration of the of the material I'm thinking. But again, I haven't had any problems. I, I fish this a lot, um, and I don't have any problems with the wing case coming loose or the um, the rib. So goes there. I'm using rusty brown ADOT. Again, I'm going to start this. I'm not quite as persnickety, so to speak, with my nymphs as I am with dry flies. You can start to thread basically anywhere you want. I'm going to come on back to the actual tie-in spot for the, for the uh, tail. I've got one of the one of the feathers ready to go. I'm gonna pull about I don't know what is that about three eighths of an inch worth. I'm gonna pull this pull this uh, off of off of a hack. I'll always pull the feather, not the tips, and I always pull down toward the butt end. That way, it usually pops off well without without misaligning the tips. Get rid of this. These feet and fuzzies down here. That's not going to look right. All right. Tail, I like to have about half of the hook shank length. Or thereabouts. I'm spinning my thread counterclockwise again. So it'll just come up and want to go over toward my. Get rid of some of this extra length here. Need to tie in my uh, oval gold tinsel, which I've got some right here. Short piece, all ready to go. I like to tie these in on the bottom. So when I start wrapping it, it comes up from the other side. Make sure that's wrapped down. All right, dubbing. This dubbing, this is really, uh, frankly, unique dubbing. It's got the real long strands, and it's got the small or the shorter, buggier ones, so you can bug it up. And it's got some really nice colors in there. And not very much. I won't be as sparse with this nymph as I was on the dry fly. Counter wrap this. We'll usually get four turns, I'm sorry, five turns, and the fifth one will be uh, in front. Well, it end up being covered up probably. I like to bring this in front of the thread, reach around, grab it, and then just take a turn, and that ties it off. If you notice, I haven't done the bodkin holder throw over, bobbin holder throw over method to, to tie things off. We all know that works. We all know that works well. I just, I've always felt, okay, so we've, we've got a, I've always felt it was a little awkward, frankly. We've got a, a material hand, and we've got a bobbin holder hand. And whenever we wrap materials and we hold it up, we're holding it with our hand that we normally have the bobbin in, and we grab the bobbin holder with our other hand. And so we got the hands reversed and we're throwing this over. And it's, again, it's not really uh, cumbersome, but it's always seemed a little awkward to me. So as soon as I figured out or learned how to uh, avoid that, I do at all costs now. Things just flow a little smoother as far as I'm concerned. Don't have to switch hands. I'll cut this with my utility scissors. There is some metal in there. All right, now, next step, I need to tie on some peacock curl for the wing case. And I want to tie it in by the butts for strength, but not the very butt end because it's pretty 
stiff. I do want to be able to bend it over for the wind case. Line that down. Make sure it's staying on top. I really want to have, actually, I'm going to let me do that because I'm going to try to make it flatter. A little better. Okay. Time for some rubber legs, silly legs, I should say. And now we all know I cut this piece in half, tie half on this side, tie half on that side, and have four legs. But I like to do it a little bit differently. I um, actually I do this for the beginning students. I tell them I'm going to make two wraps with my thread, make one cut with my scissors, and I'll have four legs. So lift this up, actually, in between the vise and, uh, and the thread. Lift and actually pick the thread out. Take one turn. I'm going to repeat that. I'm going to run it in between the vise and the thread. Lift up. I'm going to hold it there because there's not much holding it on. Get my adjustment right for the length. And take a second turn. And then what I do at the beginning class is reach in, cut that loose, and I got four legs. And they just think I'm great. Beginners are easy to impress. You guys is a little bit different story. Okay. Back to some dubbing. I have two or three wraps of dubbing in between the front and rear legs. Hope that doesn't bother anybody that I haven't cut that loose yet. I find it key. It stays out of the way a little bit better. One, two, three, right there. Yeah, I need to dub the thorax. What is kind of the thorax area? I don't really consider this a nymph. I consider that there's my four legs. I consider it an attractor slash nymph. Now, my wing case over. Don't need how those flare out. It's almost like deer hair. Yeah. Cut these the XLs off. I have heard it said. When you got a, several materials like that together, if you cut them off individually, <laughs> pardon me, you'll end up with a better cut. I can't disagree with that. Now, let's get this up a little bit. There's some knot. Half hitch again. And I'm only going to put like a two-turn whip finish because there's a lot of thread building up here already. And I do want to put my band of color in there so I'll know how this is uh, weighted. The weight that I use is the smallest amount of lead that I would use on this pattern. So the way I mark it is with a band of color right here behind the V. If there's no band of color, it's just the thread that I tied the fly with. That means I didn't add any lead, ex any lead at all. If I have a yellow band here, that tells me that's the smallest amount of lead that I would have put. And if there's a red band there, that would be the largest amount that I may put on this particular pattern. So I can just glance down in my box and I see that that one has 
Most now, I think I've got one here that type the red. I was looking for, you know. Don't seem right off, but you guys get the you guys get the picture. If I look down at the box and there's uh, red there, that's the heaviest amount of lead that I used under there. Now, I don't think I have OCD, but something is crying to me to cut those front legs shorter than the rear. So there is the only. And the last fly that I had planned for this evening. Questions, comments? Great fly. I'll bet that worked good for uh, bluegill and crappie, too. Yes, yes. Bluegill love it. I've caught, let's say, I've, I, I mentioned that I caught uh, smallmouth here in my local water. Yeah. I um, have caught bluegill, sunfish, uh, rock bass, just about anything that's in Ohio waters that will we'll, uh, we'll bite on that. Cool. Thank I, you. I'll tell, I tell you, Gary, a couple of, couple of points. Well, number one, I was so busy writing here, getting all the tips on paper that, that you were going over. I'm going to have to go watch the, the video just to, to see the actual presentation. Excellent oh, presentation, by the way. And um, uh, as a member of uh, Project Healing Waters in Omaha, uh, we would sure love to have you present to the to the veterans there at some point in time. I'll, I'll let the program lead contact you. That's John Wright. But Okay, that's if fine. You'd be, if you'd be interested, we'd sure love to have you. Oh yeah, sure. I'd, I'd be happy to do that. Not a problem. So I love the pattern. I one of the things I would probably do though is I'd probably use organza for the body. <laughs> I like that fuzzy effect with all those little fibers stick out. Oh yeah, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah, that's good. That's a good idea. If uh, you mentioned someone getting uh, getting in touch with me, actually, I've. I've got uh, two other things I'd like to mention. Um, if anybody wants to get a hold of me and if do, Project yes. Healing Waters wants to get in touch with me, the, I have a real easy email to get a hold of. Tire1, one, number one, at hotmail.com. T-Y-E-R, number one, at hotmail.com. And if hmm. any, if anybody would want to join in on my tie and lie, it's open to the public. Anybody, any of you would want to uh, to join in it's the third friday of every month and it's it's um i start at 6 30 al starts at six his time but there's a two hour time difference so you could feasibly come and watch my tie and lie i rarely go over an hour and uh mm -hmm. and then take half hour 20 minute break and then check in with out with the bt's uh fly time you could have a whole evening of fly time if you want all you would we need to do recommend is that in fact we recommend it so highly. If you'll send me your link the week before, the, your Zoom link, I'll include right. it with the invite that goes out from me every Monday. Okay. So that right. on, on that third week, we can say if you're interested, you could start the you could start the evening by joining Gary, and then an hour and a half later or whatever, you could join us. Oh. Yep. Yeah, that would be great. Um, I'll have to do some. Some figuring out how to send the link. It's what it is. It's buckeyeflyfishers.com is our homepage. And just go to the uh, calendar and it's got my name listed. And uh, and there's a link right there that they're already put in for probably the rest of the year. Okay. But that's great. Thank you, Al. Yeah, of course. And all you need to do is send me that um, on the Sunday before. The Friday that we're going to be doing it, um, just just send me the link to the page that it's on, so I, and I know how to pull the the link out and put it into my email to the to our group. Okay, all right, great, 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 appreciate that. Let's see, you know, I think we've got. I'm still just blown away by the odd vodka whip whip finish and half hitch. I am. Um, I know I'm going to be busy practicing that. Now I'm going to ask you a personal question. How many times did you stab yourself before you learned how to work around the point of that bodkin? I don't recall ever doing it. Um, oh, good for you. I, 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 I was over here trying it just now, and, and it's a good thing I was doing it with imaginary thread because I would have gotten myself. 
actually when I, I don't do it when I'm tying uh, on camera, but actually when I tie, I hold my scissors and I put my bodkin in like so. And that's the way I tie. That way I can get, I got to my scissors and I can get to my uh, tool to do my half hitch. So you hold the bodkin all the time you're holding the scissors and tying? Yeah. Oh, I don't wow. do it online because things things get ugly from time to time. So I don't do it when I'm tying. <laughs> I got you. I understand completely. <laughs> I'm going to set this up just a little bit. Last week we had some discussion about the expense of um, CDC. And I didn't even think about it at the time, but we have a good substitute for CDC. So let's get to the tip. And the weekly tip tonight is going to be a CDC substitute. And uh, we'll uh, present that to all of you. And in fact, we're going to take a look at a fly that's tied with the substitute. There it is right there. Wing is uh, almost a sink proof type of a wing, just like CDC is. Let's go over here, though, and we'll take a look at the product. You've seen it before because, like I've told you in the past, I have a love affair with soft tackle and chickaboo. Well, in the materials area, now you know that if we come back to the vise and I hold this feather up, so this is one that has not been treated with what I'm going to talk about. And it, it goes into the water and sucks up that water like it was yesterday. Really, really soaks it up fast. So I, we'll just set that aside. And we'll go back to this. And in this pelt that I have here, we've got the chickaboo part right here and the soft tackle here. Now, the only part that's been treated so that it is waterproof, if you will, with this stuff right here. It's called Kiwi Camp Dry. Heavy duty water repellent. You're supposed to put it on clothes and stuff like that. Now, when I say you treat this area with that, you don't just give it a light spray and call it good. You soak that thing down so the whole pelt looks like that single feather. But it's soaked down with that water repellent that camp dry, kiwi camp dry. Then you hang it up and let it dry for a couple days. Now I've got a couple of things to show you in the five mile bar pool. What I have there is I have a CDC feather floating on the top. I have a treated chickaboo floating on the top and I've got a fly tied out of the treated chickaboo. There you can see on the right, you can see the chickaboo feather. It's obviously got all that fuzz at the base end. In between the two, you can see the fly. And then you've got a feather right next to it. Now, let me see if I can zoom in just a little bit. Anyway, there it is. Now, those have been in the pool in that water since yesterday morning at 11. And just looking at my watch, well, it's just rounded off. It's been 30, 30 hours. They're all floating there. I want you to notice, so I'm going to move in on the fly. The, the hook in the body has already become waterlogged. It is under the surface, but the wing is still holding it above. So let's just move up here. Now there's the feather. Just so you know, right there, it's really hard to see, but there is the CDC feather. There's the chickaboo feather, and there's the fly. And the fly that you see there in the background is the one that usually swims in the pool. But that guy has been sitting there floating for 30 hours. And as I say, the hook is completely below the surface because the body is just totally waterlogged. The only thing holding it up is um, is that is the treated uh, chickaboo. Now, we were talking earlier about uh, about the presentation that we had with uh, with the pheasant, with the guys in Europe earlier today. Think about all of the great feathers in a pheasant skin that you could you could use it you could treat all the butt ends in fact let me go back to the vice here's the feather that i took this fly that we have in the vice was tied out of this feather we have enough fibers here to do probably a couple of 16s one from each side and then you got all this fuzzy stuff down here 
And if you do a good job of treating it, there's some small flies in there as well, but at least three flies, three flies to the feather. That's a good 16 wing right there. All out of that treated stuff. Anyway, that's tonight's tip. Cheap CDC. You pick the feather you want to treat. Use the Kiwi Camp Dry on it. And I won't say it's unsinkable, but it doesn't tend to sink real quick. For now, folks, that's a wrap. Until next week, we're the Beaties in Boise, Idaho. Join us again.